Good morning. Thank you so much for joining this morning, Pastor Phyllis. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak this morning. I want to also welcome those who are watching online this morning. We're so glad you joined us. This morning, um, before we start with the actual message, the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me this past week as I've been seeking God on what to preach about. Um, the Lord wanted me to take a moment and share Exodus 17, 8 through 13. And um, Dave's going to put it up there on the screen for us here in a moment. But what it says is, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses, he Moses held up his hand, Israel would prevail. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. So here we have the Amalekites and Israelites in a battle against each other. Every time, I want you to grab a picture of this, every time that Moses had his hands up, Israel would be winning that battle. But every time his arms would start to droop, the Amalekites would start taking over. Aaron and Hur realized what was going on, and they quickly come up around Moses. Okay, let's give it a minute here. I think, I don't know, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. I can hear everyone. <laughs> okay, so this morning, 
we as the body need to come around our pastor, our lead pastor, which is Pastor Phyllis, and we need to upgird her. So if you're, you're welcome to come up here and help lift, lay hands on her or extend a hand out, I welcome you to come up here and lay hands on our pastor, our lead pastor, as we pray in obedience to the Holy Spirit. Praise you, Holy Spirit. Father, in obedience to your Holy Spirit, we come before you, God. We come boldly in your throne room, and we pray, God, first and foremost, that you would be glorified in this place, that your will would be done, God. We pray for a fresh anointing over Pastor Phyllis as our lead pastor, Holy Spirit. We come alongside of her like Aaron and her, and we lift her up. We lift up her arms and help her fight the battle that you've called us to. A battle, God, that would serve you. A battle, God, that would bring you glory and honor because it's all about you. It was never about us. Father, we pray that your anointing would fall fresh on this place and that you would take your rightful place in this home. God, we pray right now that you would be the lead in this place and you would direct every step, every word that comes out of our mouth, that your will would be done, Holy Spirit, and that you, you would be glorified. We ask that you would forgive this church, God, for where we failed, where we failed to lift up Pastor Phyllis, Father. And we pray, God, that you would just bring us into a humble servanthood to you and to your will. We ask you to bless this church, God. Bless our home. Bless our churches, God. Lord, we love you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Praise you, Jesus. Just a little bit real quick on how the Lord called Harry and me to this church. Last summer, we had found, a, our daughters had told us about a lake out in Hillsdale called Bobby Lake. Many of you are probably familiar with it. Bobby? We're, Bo Bobby. 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 I'll get that right. Beautiful lake, Bobby Lake. We fell in love with it and decided to start coming out here to, to enjoy the beautiful scenery. And as we were driving past this little church, I've never been so drawn to a little church before as I was to this one. And I would tell Harry, there's something about that church. There's just something. I just feel such a draw there. So one day, we didn't know if you guys were open. We didn't know. It was during the week. And so we said, you know, let's stop in there and look. So Harry looked and peeked in the windows. And he came back to the car. And he said, oh, yeah. He goes, it's a church. It's going. They've got communion up at the altar. And there's pamphlets at the door. And I thought, well, Lord, that's wild. Why was I so drawn to faith assembly here in Hudson? But I prayed for Pastor Phyllis, didn't know her, but I prayed for this church. And I just said, Lord, bless this church and help it to grow. Let it be your will in this church. And I let it go. This was in the summer. And back in October, I had to go to a business trip in, in Mexico. And the same day that I left, unknown to me, I got an email from Pastor Phyllis, who I've never met. And apparently she was talking to another pastor from our district, and um, Pastor Lori had told her that maybe I would be able to come along and help her. So she reached out to me and said, Cindy, would you be interested in coming to help me? And I sort of kind of froze at my computer, and I thought, Lord, what's going on? And I said to Harry, I said, you're not going to believe who contacted me. And he said, who? And I said, that little church, that little church on the way to Hillsdale. And so it took us probably a good month and a half, I think, to connect because our schedules were so busy. But up until that point, I, Harry and I, we come from Bethany. You know, that was where our home church was at. And so we had no intentions of leaving Bethany. We were very involved there. And um, I met with Pastor Phyllis on December 8th. That was a very amazing day for me because when I walked in here, the Holy Spirit just started dealing with me and just giving me all kinds of visions and dreams. And I'm going, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I didn't even share it with Pastor Phyllis because when we talked, I told her, I said, we have no intentions of leaving Bethany. 
Um, let me pray about how I can help you. But I could not get away from this church. And all the way home, my mind was just reeling. And so by the time I got home, I said to Harry, I said, wow, we really need to pray for that little church. And I couldn't stop talking about it. He looked at me and he said, we are staying at Bethany, aren't we? And I never said one word about leaving. And I said, well, I think we need to seek, seek the Lord. Because in reality, when she asked me to help, we were trying to figure out what that looked like for us because we weren't planning on leaving. But we failed to ask the Lord what his will was for our lives. And so we started seeking him diligently. And needless to say, he made it clear to us that we need to come alongside of Pastor Phyllis and Dave and upgird them and help be the body in this church. So that's why we're here today. The Holy Spirit led us here. We're here to stay until he moves us out. So whatever his plan is, we're here to be used and we're just open to that. So let's recap on last week's message before I begin. Let me grab a tissue here. If you remember, Pastor Phyllis was talking to us last week about living hope. She was talking about 1 Peter, first chapter. Peter was talking to the exiled believers. They were exiled because they were pushed out of their homes. They were persecuted. They were tested because of their faith. They were treated like a sideshow in a circus, thrown to lions, just so that they can enjoy watching the Christians suffer and shake. Yet these Christians, these believers, though their lives were at risk, they had faith in Jesus. Peter still reminds them that Jesus is their living hope through all of this. Even though they're being persecuted, Jesus is their living hope. Jesus was their living hope through his resurrection from the dead, through all eternity. The Bible tells us these exiled believers, they never saw him, yet they loved him. They never saw him, but they believed in him. They never saw him, but they rejoiced in him, and they were filled with his glory. Think about this. In order for them to stand firm on their faith, they had to have a good understanding about our Abba Father. They had to know that, his, that he would never leave them and he would never forsake them, even though they were being persecuted. They had to understand about the sanctification of the Holy Spirit because they were sanctified. They were set apart from the others, literally. They were exiled and set apart to be persecuted. But they were also declared holy, and they were in obedience to Jesus, even in the face of persecution. So today's message, called to be holy, we're going to read from 1 Peter 1, 13 and 14. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Now, what's Peter saying here? Remember, he's speaking to persecuted believers but he's reminding them, once we repent and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are expected, expected, it's mandatory that we turn away from our sin, turn away from the ways of the world. They don't line up with the Lord or his word. It's not an option, folks. We don't have a choice. Light and darkness, it cannot mix. It just can't. Apostle Paul pleads with the believers in Romans 12, 1 through 2. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, am I saying we're all perfect? Absolutely not. We'll never be reach that total perfection until we're with him, but we're to strive for perfection. Let me just share with you, back before I accepted Jesus, I was a very rebellious teenager. I was raised in a different denomination. My parents gave us a firm foundation in who God was, who Jesus was, and who the Holy Spirit was. But I was a rebellious teenager. I didn't care what kind of trouble I got into. I 
partied with my friends. I didn't care about life. I didn't care if I lived and I didn't care if I died. I didn't care about anything. I'm not happy about that, but I'm just putting that out there. When I was 18, I had a cousin who came back from, from down south and um, she told me Jesus was coming back and it totally wigged me out. I just did not understand that. But when I turned 18 and I graduated, she bought me my very first Bible and I started reading it. I started reading it for myself and I started questioning what his word was saying to me. And I dug deeper until I started understanding and I sought understanding by others who knew. I had to know what that Bible was telling me. Yet when I accepted him at such a young age, I thought in my young Christian mind that I can still hang out with my friends, that it wouldn't matter if I still socialized with them. So what I did was I still went around them. Unfortunately, they were not in good places. And it wouldn't be long before I'd fall flat on my face where I'd backslid. And I didn't understand that either. When I was 19, but here, here, let me back up a moment. When that happened, I didn't have a full revelation of who Jesus Christ was as in reality. I was still conformed to the worldly views. I didn't understand how to discern the will of God. And I knew what was good and acceptable, but I didn't see the harm in staying connected with my worldly friends and the worldly ways of life. I just didn't understand what the big deal was. That's when I fell flat on my face and I continued to party with my friends. And I continued, I actually smoked two and a half packs of cigarettes a day at a very young age. I don't say that to brag. I say that because there's other revelation I'm gonna share with you. When I was 19, I lost my job. I had my own apartment, I hit rock bottom. I didn't know where the next dime was gonna come from. I didn't know how I was gonna pay my rent. I didn't want to move back home. I stopped going out. That's one thing I did, which was a good thing. And I lost all hope. It was the summer of 81. And I'd find myself laying on my bed, just beside myself, not knowing what to do. And I cried out to God. I just laid there and I can just tell the Holy Spirit was with me. And I, I said, I laid there on that bed and I said, Lord, I don't know why you want me, but here I am. Here I am. I'm done. I'm done with the worldly ways. Now, did I quit smoking right away? No, because it was a bad habit. Did I stop drinking? I sort of kind of, but not all the way, so the answer is no to that. However, this time it was different. It was totally different. This time I had a revelation of who Jesus Christ was. I understood, um, I could hear my father's voice. I could finally hear my spiritual father's voice, which is a big thing. I was finally tuned in. I was spiritually connected with the Holy Spirit. I desired the things of God, not the world. I wanted my mind to be transformed to his thoughts. I wanted the Lord to renew my mind. The Holy Spirit continued to convict my heart on things that didn't please him. I did my best, and I listened and obeyed to the Holy Spirit as quickly as I could. On Christmas Day over 37 years ago, I turned to my brother-in-law. Harry had brought me out here to, to be with his family. It was before we got married. And I remember turning to my brother-in-law and handing him my pack of cigarettes and saying, I'm done. I just felt like the Lord was telling me, that's it, Cindy. Today's the day. Let it go. Let it go. That day, I was instantly delivered. Instantly, from two and a half packs of cigarettes a day from high school. I was instantly delivered. I never craved another cigarette. I can't explain it other than it was the Holy Spirit. I had no withdrawals, and I absolutely had no regrets. And here's why I share all this. When we first realize we need Jesus, we need true repentance and acceptance to Jesus. We need to accept Jesus over the world from the beginning. So many times I think at the moment, you know, what, what I've experienced and, and watched is sometimes people make that salvation call, but there's not a true connection. It's more that it's a thing to do. Well, it's not just a thing to do. It's a spiritual act. 
It's a spiritual act of worship, accepting Jesus and recognizing and getting a revelation of who he is. God does accept us. Does God accept us just as we are? Absolutely. I believe that. I don't believe anybody needs to wait until they are perfect because we're never going to get there. Jesus expects us to come to him just as we are. Now, for those of us that are seasoned believers, we have to understand this too. When a new believer comes in, that when they accept Jesus, there's going to be some rough edges there. But until the Holy Spirit can reveal truth to that person, we can talk until the cows come home. It takes the Holy Spirit to change the heart. We can't do that. We can only lead them to the Lord. But does God want us to stay just as we are? Absolutely not. That's the, that's the other thing is that when you accept Jesus, he doesn't want you to stay just as you are. You need to be able to be open to the Holy Spirit transforming your mind, able to start discerning what pleases God and what doesn't. That's why we're told in 1 Peter 15 and 16, but as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Not an option, folks. We don't have a choice. God is calling us to a standard of being holy because he's holy. He wants us to be holy. We're supposed to be transformed in his image. We are supposed to be like him. We should desire to be more like him on a daily basis. Even when we make mistakes, we pick ourselves back up and say, and say, God, forgive us. Help me to walk that path that you've called me to, to be holy. We are called to be holy because he is holy, not an option. Here's the key. We must be open again to the Holy Spirit transforming our hearts and our minds. The Holy Spirit has amazing transforming power that only he has, and he has the ability to change us where we don't think we could be changed. We need to be open to the Holy Spirit showing us what pleases God. And what doesn't? Even as believers, if we're seasoned Christians, we think that we're okay. Well, let me challenge you. <laughs> let me challenge you to ask the Lord, show me what, ple what pleases you, Lord. And, and oh, Lord, by the way, show me what doesn't. But you need to be open because you might be surprised what he shows you. All I can encourage you to do is that when he shows you, be quick to repent and get yourself right. If we sincerely want to serve Jesus, we'll be open to the leading of his Holy Spirit. It's all about the heart. In Romans 8, 5 through 8, it tells us, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not submit to, the, to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let me say that again. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. We might think that we are, but if we're living in the flesh, we're not pleasing him. Remember when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are sanctified. We are set apart, folks. We are set apart. We're not from the world. We are set apart because of the blood of Jesus. That's what separates us. We're called to be holy. We're different. If we look the same as the world, then are we really different? Are we really set apart? Our past sins are forgotten by the Lord, but we need to be willing to turn from our sins. So many times we dabble in even the smallest amount of sin that we think that it's okay. We think that nobody's going to see anything. We may not see it, but we can't fool the Holy Spirit. He sees it, he knows it, and you can't run from him. Remember, we are called to be holy. To be forgiven, we must truly, truly repent. If we repent, we must be willing to turn away from sin. I can't stress that enough. Do we as Pentecostal believers believe in unconditional love? Absolutely, right? We believe in unconditional love. God loves us unconditionally. No doubt about that. He loves us more than we can ever fathom in our minds. Do we believe 
as Pentecostals an under, un, unconditional salvation. In other words, do we believe once saved, always saved? And the answer to that is absolutely not. But here's reality. We were all born with a free will, a free will to choose to follow Jesus or turn away. You know, God tells us in his word, he never leaves us, nor does he ever forsake us. And he doesn't. We're the ones that turn away. We're the ones, when the minute we start dabbling in sin, because he cannot mix with sin at all. So the minute we turn even the slightest bit, we have turned away from God and what his plan is for us. Little story back to Turkeyville. Back a few years ago, we went with um, some seniors from our, I'm not a senior, by the way, but <laughs> we went with some seniors to Turkeyville. And I don't know if you've ever been to Turkeyville, but we went and we watched a show there and we had a nice lunch. And after lunch, they sort of kind of dismiss you because they're going to change the tables for your dessert and everything. And then you get the second part of the show. So during this time, we take bathroom breaks and everything. And Harry and I walk out of there and we run into this older gentleman who his daughter had been very ill. And I had been up to the hospital multiple times to see her. So we stopped to talk to him. Well, I thought we stopped, but Harry wandered into the store part. But I continued to talk to this gentleman because I was really concerned about his daughter. And when we got done talking, I turned around and went into the store and I was trying to find him and the store was packed. I thought, where on earth is he? And then I could hear him. And I hear him over by some other stuff over behind stuff where I couldn't see him, but I can hear his voice and he's going, I have no idea where she's at. <laughs> And he's looking all around and he's just, and I just followed his voice until I got to him. And I, and I still heard him say, I have no idea where he's at. And when I got there, he goes, there you are. Where have you been? And I said, right where you left me. We were both standing there, but he had walked away from me. It's a new process for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's the same as when we turn from the Lord. God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. His word tells us that it's a promise. He will not leave us once we, once we choose to follow him. When you can't figure out where he's at and you can't feel him by you and you, and you just think he's deserted you, I challenge you, stop in your tracks right where you're at and figure out when you started feeling that and what you were in the midst of. Could it possibly be that you turned the wrong way? When we knowingly turn to sin to gratify our flesh, we are choosing, choosing to follow the things of this world and in the same time turning away from the Lord. 1 Peter 1, 1, um, 17 through 25. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. 
and his word is the good news that was preached to you. In order to be holy as he is holy, we must first be willing to pre repent with a sincere heart. That's the first thing. We must turn away from sin. And we must accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There are no shortcuts. All the money in the world can't buy it. Being merely a good person isn't going to cut it. Attempting to follow Jesus only when it's convenient. Convenient won't get us into heaven. And it will not make any of us holy as he is holy. We are either all in or we're not in it at all. And that's hard to grab a hold of, but that's reality. We are either all in it for the kingdom of God or we're not in it at all. You know, we have a dying world here. And it's so evident on a daily basis when you even just turn on the news for five minutes. At the end times, it's not going to matter if you're Democrat or Republican. None of that's going to matter. God don't care. He don't care. He wants to know if you've accepted his son. It's all about his son. He wants to know how many people we reached. He wants to know if we have been loving to people, even the unlovely. He wants to know if we've helped the widow and the orphan children. He wants to know if we're making a difference for his kingdom. You know, where we came from, we were very comfortable. We were very, very, you know, I was, I was very involved, but we were very comfortable. Ministry is not comfortable. God calls us to get out of our comfort zone so that we can reach people for him. Each one of us has a task to do. There is no middle ground. There's no sitting on a fence. There is absolutely no sitting on a fence. God's word says he'd rather be you be cold or hot instead of lukewarm. Instead of lukewarm. Folks, we must allow the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. That's where it begins. We have to be open to the Holy Spirit and his leading. He deserves his rightful place right here in the front of this pulpit, taking the lead on the service. It's not going, Dave. I'm sorry. The green light's on. Okay. I'm going to set it right there. Maybe I'm doing something. Okay. As we draw closer to the Holy Spirit, He reveals truth. He convicts our hearts to turn away from sin, and He turns us completely towards God. Let me close. But please understand, we true believers are exiled from the world. Ezekiel 36, 22 through 26. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you, through you and me and everybody in here and those watching by internet today, when through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I believe this is for the church today. I believe it is for faith assembly here in Hudson. 
I believe it is for other churches that are online today. If you consider yourself a believer, you are, you belong to God's family, one church, one church. And I believe he's talking to the church today. Let's not miss this. The Lord has a plan and a purpose for his church. That's us. He has a plan and a purpose for the city of Hudson and the surrounding areas. That excites me. It does. I cannot get away from what I believe God wants to do in this community. He has a plan and a purpose to use our church. That's us. That's us, folks. He wants to use us to vindicate his holiness. Grab a hold of that. He wants this little church here in Hudson to be used to vindicate his holiness. That's powerful. That's exciting that God would look down on a small little church in Hudson and say, I'm not done with you yet. I want to use you. Are you willing? Are you open to my plan, my purpose? He wants to sprinkle clean water on you and on me so that we can be clean from all uncleanliness. That includes any idols that we may be holding on to. Oh, I love my TV, Cindy. I just can't possibly put that down and pray. I love my cell phone. I'm constantly on it. I'm just throwing things out there, folks, for you to think about. I don't need to list them. You know what's hindering you. You know yourself what hinders you from a close walk with the Lord. He wants to give us a new heart and a new spirit with each of us. He wants to remove our hearts of stone and give us a heart of flesh. You know, you might... You might be very loving and, and walk in God's ways, and, and, and I'm sure that all of us do. But because we're not perfect, one of the challenges is saying, God, if you see a hardened heart part inside of me, soften it. Soften it. Make it a heart of flesh completely. That I'd be so sensitive to your Holy Spirit and your leading that nothing would stop me from your plan and your purpose. Only then can he use us for his glory. That's the only time he can fully use us for his glory. When we completely lay down our will and say, not our will, but yours. When Harry and I had to make a decision, we had gotten together with Pastor Phyllis and Dave and, and we visited one day. And that morning, Harry was praying and the Holy Spirit was dealing with him. And I could tell and I didn't say anything because I already knew we were supposed to be here. So I just left it alone. But we went out. To, to lunch that afternoon. And I said to him, I said, so what do you think? He goes, I think we're starting a new chapter of our life. And I said, okay, so can I let Pastor Phyllis know? And he said, absolutely. She had no way to know that I was going to text her and say, by the way, the Lord wants us to move our, ourselves right into your church and, as members, as members, if you're okay with that. And of course she was. It was like, okay, we're going to start coming, but then we needed to you know, give a couple weeks to our church so that we can leave properly. But you know what? It wasn't about our will. We had no intentions of leaving. But I got to tell you this. When we decided to put our will down and follow the Lord, there was such a joy that came over Harry and me. And let me tell you, he was at Bethany for over 54 years. He grew up there. We raised our kids there. I was there for over 34 years. We are comfortable. That was our home church. But there was an excitement that just boiled over when we put our will aside and said, not our will, Lord, but your own. What, what do you want us to do? 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Did you catch that? Don't miss this. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That means each one of us has been, been given the Spirit of manifestation. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. To each, each one of us has been given the manifestation of the Spirit. Not just some of us. Just because... Pastor Phyllis and I went through the schooling doesn't mean that we have this greater 
uh, manifestation. His word tells us that each one of us has the manifestation of the spirit. Each one of us, each person sitting here, each person watching online this morning. First Samuel two, two through three. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is no, none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Folks, it comes back to what I said earlier. We may be able to fool those around us, but understand, we can never, never fool the Holy Spirit. One day we will stand before the Lord and give an account for our walk with him. We'll either hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, you may enter in. And hopefully we don't hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. That's detrimental, folks. That's detrimental. The Lord is calling each one of us into accounts in these last days. If you don't believe we're in the last days, look around. The word says, we'll call, pe- we'll call that which is good, evil, and that which is evil, good. And that is exactly what we do today. There's no getting around that. There's absolutely no getting around that. We call the most evil things good and condemn the godly principles of God's word. God have mercy on our country. He is calling us to be holy because he is holy. The question remains, will you answer the call? Will you answer the call? Let us pray.